Hi, I'm Chris Coven. I'm the founder of Ivy Life. And today we have a wealth management or financial literacy masterclass, which we think is a very appropriate topic with these sort of rapid changes that we're all seeing in the economy in the last few years due to the pandemic and uh, war in Ukraine and other factors. So we thought it was very timely. Um, just a quick note on some things happening within Ivy Life. This presentation is really part of a new uh, program that we're developing at Ivy Life to really showcase all the incredible expertise that we have across the Ivy Life membership community. So we'll be having a series, a monthly series uh, featuring experts from around the Ivy League alumni community on topics that we think are highly relevant to large segments of the community. So I'm really excited to have a, a wonderful uh, community of experts here with us today. I also want to thank Victor Lee, who's been working hard with Ivy Life, trying to develop this program and others. And also, I want to thank Franklin Young, who many of you know, who's really helping us build out the digital infrastructure of Ivy Life. We're trying to make the online community much easier to use and also more powerful. So special thanks to them. And so without further ado, Victor, please, uh, I'll pass the mic to you if you could please introduce our panelists. Terrific. Thank you very much, Chris. So uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, showing up today. Uh, we're very excited because, you know, we're, we're, as Chris said, we're definitely trying to, um, uh, you know, do some, try some news things with Ivy Life and be particularly, uh, you know, interested in, and uh, provide value to the members. So we have really a terrific panel of, uh, of financial advisors with us today. Um, you know, all folks who are, you know, very, uh, who are members of Ivy Life have been very active with Ivy Life in the past. And we thought it was a good, a good opportunity for the other folks in Ivy Life to get to know these people a little bit better and really understand sort of the, the depth of their, of their knowledge. And hopefully it'll be helpful to everybody on the call. So just to keep it very brief, uh, our, four, our four folks are, are Chase Wickenheiser uh, uh, from Cornell, as I, as I recall, uh, Hannah Ahmed, who a fellow Harvardian, uh, Jessica Wong, who I think is Wharton, if, I, if I'm correct, and uh, Russell, uh, Russell Rivera, uh, yet another Harvardian. And no, we did not try to uh, sort of stack the deck uh, in, in, in our favor. So what we're going to do is have each of the four panelists talk for about you know five seven minutes uh, about a particular topic that they've uh, chosen and then we will throw it open for questions afterwards so if we as chris said if we could ask everybody to either hold your questions or put them in the chat then you know i expect that we'll have a fairly robust discussion about a lot of these topics uh, when we're done so the topics for today uh, you know we, we'll take the folks in alphabetical order uh, you know certainly by first name so we'll start with chase who's going to talk about sort of financial literacy and lay the foundation a little bit for the group uh hannah's going to talk about uh, family planning which i'm sure everybody on this call is very concerned about uh jessica will tell us a little bit about insurance uh, and you know kind of weave her story into it and because obviously insurance is a big topic and i think it's one that certainly many of us you know, myself in particular are really not as familiar with as we should be and then uh bringing up the you know closing out the panel will be russell who's going to be talking about the question that's on everybody's mind which is what's the story with inflation what do we do about it how do we protect ourselves uh, especially as we go into the fall so that's the plan i'm going to try to get out of the way here and so on chase if you could just get started and uh, tell us everything we need to know about financial literacy 101 in the next uh Seven minutes. Sounds like a plan. No, thank you, Victor, for the introduction. So to everyone in the group, Chase Wickenheiser, Cornell grad. And the reason really I chose the topic of financial literacy is it's been a side project of mine outside of my regular business, but a side passion of mine for now the past year and a half. I've been it first kind of started back in my alma mater at Cornell for the past several semesters. I've been returning to Cornell's campus and pre been presenting financial literacy to all of the athletic departments on campus. I was a former Cornell football player, Use my connections there and I've now been returning for the past several semesters and teaching every athlete on campus. It's been well received to the standpoint of now we're planning next academic calendar year to present to the law school, vet school, and a few divisions within the graduate school as well. And outside of the Ivy Life and the Ivy League and everything else like that, because we're planning to potentially present to Columbia and UPenn continuing there, medical residents to a few associate law uh, lawyers within a few law firms within the city. And it's really expanding Boys and Girls Club of America. And the overall passion, what I'm trying to get across in today's session is how important it is to really introduce 
financial literacy to the younger generation, the 20 year olds, the 15, basically, you know, 25 year old age group and demographic. And so that's what I'm hoping to get away where to telling everyone a little bit about what I think are the four main fundamentals of what people at that age should be learning or at least exposed to and potentially how you can start doing it with your own kids and everything else like that. And so there's a lot of customization that goes into all my presentations with medical residents. Sometimes we have to discuss disability insurance. So I know probably Jennifer, Jessica, you understand all, all there the complexities with medical professionals and their higher threshold for disability. But outside of the common customization for each group, the main four things I try to get across are one, teaching them about budgeting, right? In terms of thinking about your budget as being fixed and variable. People fail at budgeting because they try to track every single little expense teaching people that focus on those small, minute um, charges that are going to be consistent every single month, track those, and then set a general variable goal and track that potentially with your credit card. It's the best way to do budgeting. And it could dive into a lot of more into that, but again, seven at a time frame. So when it comes to teaching potentially your kids and starting them now, getting them exposed to a credit card, potentially around the age 15, 16. I think right when they start driving, they have to start paying for gas. It's a pretty good time to do it allow them to start building that credit history, allow them to start thinking about, okay, my goal for a variable range is I want to spend $500 a month or $200 a month, whatever it is, and kind of sit down with them and see if they can keep consistent to whatever goal you set on a monthly basis. When it comes to investments, I start to talk to people about inflation and compounding the two opposing factors there. I talk to them about diversification and how ETFs are so crucial and important. So potentially looking there, Teach your kids how much a quarter of milk cost back in 1916. The answer is nine cents. And how basically your money changes and loses value over the years. Talks about compounding. Just show them the S&P 500 and the history there. And how one dollar, what it can really become after 20, 35 plus years. And then when it comes to diversification, you know, giving them, I like to use the goofy example whenever we went and present to a foster home down in Georgia or Boys and Girls Club of America. I give a pencil to maybe the smallest kid in the classroom I have them break the pencil. And then I hand a wad of pencils, like 10 pencils wrapped in rubber bands to the biggest, strongest looking kid. I'm like, all right, your turn, break this. Obviously you can't do it, right? So a goofy example, but a way to stress home the last point. And then the last thing I try to teach is some of the different investment vehicles and the individual account, Ross, all these other things, and basically start to emphasize you know, some of the power there. So when it comes to the Roth, I was an athlete. So the analogy metaphor that I always give, and this will be my last one before I cut off, is if I'm an athlete, if I could go back to anyone who here has played sports in the past, and I said, okay, the deal is this. I'll give you one injury when you start your career, second grade, third grade, whatever it is. You'll recover healthy as a horse, whatever it is afterwards. But then thereafter, throughout your athletic career, you'll have the 100% guarantee that you'll never be injured again. I'm talking, you won't get a broken nail, you won't get a stubbed toe, you won't get anything. How many athletes would take that bet? And whenever I was presented to Cornell, I mean, everyone's hand shot up. I mean, I dislocated my shoulder in college and it was nasty, I won't get into detail. So everyone can kind of really relate to that point. And so I emphasize I'm using that metaphor for Roth. Get taxed out of the way and let your money grow tax-free. Just start to introduce some of these concepts to people and really start to emphasize that education. I'm hoping I just kept it to around that five to seven minute mark, but if anyone has any questions on other examples or ways to basically start to promote this education within your family or and have the talk with everyone. Great advice. I just wish I'd had it when I was 25. Also, <laughs> I peaked athletically in second grade, so I, I probably would prefer a different injury time. So, Thanks, Chase. No, that, that's great. There's, there's, there's a lot to think about, but I think, you know, when you really boil it down and sort of systematize it a little bit, right, it becomes a little bit, a little bit easier to tackle. But uh, so, so step, then stepping back a little bit and thinking about the, the big picture, I, I mean, I think I'm sure we've all heard the expression that we're kind of the sandwich generation, that, you know, we have to worry about our parents. Uh, and for many of us is in, in, especially, you know, the boomers, uh, our parents are kind of getting up there in age. And at the same time, you know, I think our, our kids are having a tough time, right? It's not, it's not the economy that, that we came into when we were graduating from college. So when you, and then of course, let's not forget about ourselves. Because, you know, with any luck, I think everybody on this call, you know, we're going to be around for a few more decades. And uh, we want to make sure that, you know, we know what we're doing and that we're taking care of ourselves, as well as, you know, the, the prior generation and then the following generation. So maybe to, maybe to spend a few minutes in helping us think about that. Uh, Hannah, if you want to talk a little bit about uh, family financial planning, that'd be great. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. And can everyone hear me okay? 
Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, my name's Hannah Ahmed, graduated from Harvard, like Victor said, and my focus in my financial career and where my passion lies is financial planning. So really helping families to, or, you know, and individuals take a look at their personal goals and that personal goals encompass your family. So children, parents, um, you know, sometimes for others, it's even extended family or any charitable giving that you might want to do. And so with that, I think this is a perfect follow-up from Chase because some of the things I'm going to touch on kind of lead right into what he was saying, especially when talking about kids. But the most important piece is helping yourself first. And I know that oftentimes when I'm sitting down with people, they have a hard time embracing that, especially if they have children, for instance. Well, but I have kids. When we think of financial planning and planning for the future and how you can build in goals to, you know, ensure your kids can go to college, maybe help them with, you know, down payment for a home, weddings, et cetera, you have to make sure that your future is going to be taken care of first and foremost, because if not, you might be setting your kids up to say, hey, I'm moving in with you someday. And most of us would never want that to happen. And so that's why it's really important to ensure you're going to be able to take care of you and your spouse. And the way to do that is start by breaking down all of your goals into categories. Think of your needs, your wants, and your wishes. And from there, assign dollar amounts to each of those goals. Assign realistic amounts and then also your worst case scenario. So give that ideal number. Ideally, I would like to spend $8,000 a month. Realistically, I know I could get by on $5,000 a month. So you want to assign all of your goals numbers like that. And that way, as you're saving and evaluating your savings and any investments, you can ensure that you are going to be on the right track to accomplish the needs first. Then you can look at the wants. And then once you have those two taken care of, hey, what were those wishes that you thought might be far, far off bets? Um, and one of the things I think with Jessica speaking after me is insurance. And I know she's going to talk about that. Um, I've never sold insurance, but it is a very important piece to think about when we look at risks that could impact our future and those goals. And so how do you pass off some of that risk? And that's going to be through the use of life insurance, disability insurance. And those are important pieces so that you can keep saving and not be financially devastated from a worst case scenario that could happen. So once you know you're in good shape, now we can look at, okay, how do you help your kids plan for college? That's where building it into a budget. So how much are you going to save every month? And great ways to save primarily, you know, if we're thinking college or um, just future are 529s. And then there are UGMA and UPMAs. I'm a big fan of the 529s because of the flexibility and portability with those accounts. They can also offer some tax benefits. And with the 529 plan, every single state um, pretty much offers one, but you don't have to use your own state's 529 plan. Um, sometimes if there's not going to be a tax benefit to you specifically for using that 529 plan, you might want to use another state's because they might have lower fees. Um, and when you're thinking of helping your kids for college, this is where going back to what Chase was talking about, really make sure that you're setting your kids up for success from a financial standpoint from day one, making sure they understand money. And also another thing is just teaching them good money habits from a very early age. It's never too early to start. There are various books and tools and ways to get kids comfortable with money. And then for those that have significant family wealth, where they'll be passing it on to their children at some point in the future, prepare them for that. I can't tell you the number of clients that I've sat down with that come from a ridiculous amount of money, but they don't prepare their kids for it. And then the kids inherit it and suddenly they're 
having this sense of overwhelmingness of what do I do with this? How am I responsible? Um, how do I make decisions that would carry on my family's legacy and make them proud? So make sure that you're preparing your kids for anything that they may inherit from you someday. And then lastly, to stick within my time frame, um, helping your parents. So hopefully your parents have planned in a way that they can help themselves, but that's not the situation for everyone, um, especially when we look at, you know, for most of us, a lot of our parents came from, you know, depression era parents. And so some of that has just kind of lingered into that generation. And when looking at how to help your parents if they need it financially is first off, looking through all of their assets and getting a really good handle on what do they have, um, what are the options, and looking at other family members that could potentially provide support as well. Uh, if they can have a notebook or something completed that goes through all of their things, and not just financially, but even beyond that financial piece, um, I created a series called Planning Beyond the Will that we have posted on my company's website for that specific piece. Um, and it's a great thing all of us could do for you know our family members as well. And it's just looking at what are all of the things that you would want taken care of when your time comes, because it goes beyond just the financial piece. It's, you know, do you have pets? How do you want your pet taken care of? Um, do you have a certain type of antique, you know, stamp collection or coins, like who would you want that to go to? So really looking at your parents, helping them get a sense of their entire life picture online footprint is another really big one and compiling all of that down so that, in, you know, as a child, you'll be able to better help them and know how they want everything handled. That way it gives both of you peace of mind so that when they're incapacitated or their time comes, you can kind of take off some of that stress when you're already in that super stressful situation. And then the last piece when thinking of, you know, parents that might need longer term care, um, if they didn't have the financial means, it's really good to hop online and look at all of the different um, federal and state programs that are available to give additional support financially. Um, because again, you don't wanna compromise your own financial future to be able to help your family because then it's just gonna be a cycle that continues to repeat itself. And sometimes um, I am surprised when I, I don't, uh, you know, often work with people that are in this situation where there's not enough money. But when I have, I've been very pleasantly surprised at a lot of the resources that are out there to help elders and a big piece going to be people's homes. There's generally a lot of wealth there and there are different ways to use the equity in the home uh, to help ensure that they can live out their final days comfort comfortably. Um, so that's my time. I'm going to wrap it up. I welcome any questions at the end and uh, thanks for having me on here today. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, that was great. Uh, yeah, because There's certainly a lot to think about, especially when you think about other, other generations. Uh, but it sounds like your guiding principle is the one they used to tell us whenever you know back in the days when we used to fly around a lot which is you know when the oxygen mask pops out of the pops out of the top i think russell is already laughing at this is uh you know make sure you put your own mask on first because if you don't take care of yourself you're not really going to be in any position to help the others around you so i think i think that's you know we'll definitely have to keep that in mind um, and then the next step, I guess, is, you know, I think when we often talk about, you know, managing your financial affairs, it's about what do, we, what do you do with the money, right? The money either you have or the money that you're bringing in from your income, how do you budget, you know, as Chase was talking about. But I think, you know, another big piece of this is really thinking about what, what might happen in the future where maybe, you know, your, the money you have isn't necessarily going to cover everything and how do you prepare and protect yourself if something big really happens? You know, you know, above, above and beyond, uh, you know, as you were saying, Hannah, like, you know, the assets that you might have today. So that's why I think, you know, it's great that you know, Jessica has often sort of demystify uh, the, the world of insurance for us, and especially and you know, related back to herself, which I think is something that we can all identify with. So Jessica, you want to take it away? 
Yes, thanks. Thanks, Victor. Uh, this was very well organized. So everyone, we didn't really actually rehearse this. So if you hopefully see this, it's pretty seamless. It's just we work really well together. Go Ivy Life. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Jessica Wong, and I have been in financial planning for about 13 years. Previously, I was a CPA, worked at a public accounting firm, and uh, was a partner there. And so um, I figured uh, I would talk a little bit more about the defensive planning, uh, what oftentimes isn't talked about, because everybody talks about accumulating wealth, building, saving, investing, but not enough attention is, to, is, is paid attention to when it comes to what could happen, the what ifs, as Hannah mentioned in her um, previous talk. And so I thought I'd start there. So what is defensive planning? So defensive planning in my mind is, if you die prematurely and you have loved ones to take care of, whether you're the breadwinner or you're the homemaker, both are relevant and important. If something happens in terms of your health and you can't bring home a paycheck for some period of time, whether that's temporarily or permanently. And if down the road something happens in terms of an incapacity or frailty, we just get older and we can't just take care of ourselves the way we normally can. What do we do about that? And how do we protect our assets? And so if I equate this defensive planning to a home. When we build a home, right, it's like this, right? The foundation at the bottom and then everything else above it. But if it was like this, that's just a little wobbly, right? It's not going to happen. So that's where the defensive planning is, is the foundation of every financial plan. And so I think a, a personal story would help with this. Um, and I'm happy to share this. I um, finally gotten to a point where I can share it. Um, over nine years ago, I was diagnosed or they discovered a non-malignant tumor in my brain. I had been operated on and survived it, of course, right? The um, recovery period was you know, almost about six months or so. And if I think about it now, I'm so glad I did all of this defensive planning back when I did, because now an insurance company won't even touch me. And because they say, well, I have a condition and that condition is I've had brain surgery. And unfortunately, the tumor was not completely removed. And so my first tip to you in terms of thinking about your financial planning and your priorities is to really know, understand that defensive part. Do I have my what if covered? And if not, what might I be, be missing out on there that I need to talk to someone about? Um, second, so now I'm at a point where um, I'm nine years out. And unfortunately, and that's why when Victor asked about the timing of this, I have to go back for another surgery, my second brain surgery, mm. because this stubborn tumor will not go away and it will not stay dormant. And so next month I'm going in for my second surgery. And because I've done all this defensive planning and I'm fully insured, everything I have in place, whether it be the income protection, my life insurance, even my, what I call long-term care planning, like the incapacity and frailty, um, all of that is in place. So anything should happen. Hopefully everything goes through the second surgery as they did with the first. I have a great team in place. But if anything did happen, I have such peace of mind knowing my brother will be taken care of, my child will be taken care of, my parents will be taken care of. Those are all the people that rely on me. And so my second tip to you is get the right type of plan. And so most people think about life insurance. That's the easy one. If I have somebody that you know, relies on me, I'm going to get some life insurance. But what other things? Um, to really think about, right? Um, so that's my second tip. And my third tip to you is that when it comes to, you know, people coming to me for life insurance, I'm oftentimes going through the whole conversation around, okay, beyond life insurance, what else might be missing from the equation? And this is often overlooked, it's protecting your income. And so whether you work for somebody or you work for yourself, there are options to be able to put together a plan that covers your income, whether it be because you're out you know, for a temporary period of time, like I'll be after recovering from my surgery, or it might be more permanently. But for those that have only group insurance through the employer, consider thinking about getting some private insurance. Why? Group insurance, you have no idea what it's really going to cover you, how long it'll cover you for, and when situations will be that you won't be covered. My own private disability insurance, well, I know I'm going to be covered for that. I've already put in a claim for it. They know I'm going to be out this, this period of time and we've already processed the claim. And so it's important to really evaluate both those types of plans and make sure that you have the right ones in place. 
And so um, those are my three tips, right? So one, plan early because you just never know what could happen. Two, get the right types of plans in place. And three, make sure you look at your disability income protection. And if you have something already, is it enough for what you may need? So those are the things I, I wanted to talk about. I think I kept it pretty short. Um, any questions, feel free to put it in the chat and uh, or just open up later on for a conversation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, all, all I can say is, wow, that's quite a story. Um, and yes, you're right. We hadn't rehearsed this, and you know, you suggested your topic of you know of, of you know insurance, and you said you were going to reference your personal story. Obviously, I did not know what it, what your story was uh, prior to you just telling us all, and uh, it's astounding. So obviously, you know, congratulations on having on the last nine years, and uh, you know, I'm sure we're all looking forward to you, you know, being around for you know many multiples of nine years uh, going forward, Thank you. Um, and. And I think, you know, the other thing I just want to comment on is, is uh, you know, with, with regard to Ivy Life, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think it's great that you felt comfortable sharing that story with the group, because obviously that's, it's extremely personal. Um, and so one thing I just wanted to mention was that, you know, I appreciate the, the team having pulled itself together, you know, for this panel. And one of the reasons, you know, we didn't really rehearse was because I, I feel that everybody on the panel are folks that I, I've known for a number of years. I'm very comfortable with, uh, I regard as friends. And therefore, as you know, as I do with many of the folks who are on the call today, you know, Chris and uh, a lot of the, you know, the regular folks who are uh, in Ivy Life. So I, th I think that's great. And then also that I think we can provide, you know, hopefully more value to people by being able to be very candid uh, uh, in, in, in what we, in, 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 in the stuff we talk about. So uh, good, good luck with that, Jessica, you know, please keep us posted. And yeah. uh, you know we'll all be. You won't get rid of me that easily. So yes, I will be back. Strong <laughs> and I want to just add to Victor. Just uh, best wishes for a very speedy recovery, and thank you for your bravery and sharing that. And it it does say a lot about you and about the community of trust we have here. So I, re I really appreciate you sharing. Um, and I also just had a brief comment that tied it ties together what you're talking about, Jessica, with what Chase was speaking about, and. Um, one thing that um, it'd be good for people to be aware of that are on the younger side would be that insurance is very inexpensive when you're young and healthy. Uh, and it's a great time to get in on the ground floor with both life insurance and health insurance um, and learn about it because it does get more complex as you get older, as you grow a family, there's a lot more to think about. So it's one of those disciplines that's good to have early. And back when I started my working life, if you work for a Fortune 500 company like I started out doing, you were pretty much covered soup to nuts. I think that's not as much the case now as it used to be, number one. And number two, in this sort of emerging gig economy, I think there's lots of people that never are in that Fortune 500 ecosystem, and they really need to kind of roll their own insurance. So I'm only sharing that from my own personal experience, learning how to make sure you're covered in various ways as you become responsible for more than just yourself. So thank you, Jessica. Um, and I apologize for the interruption, but I, I thought maybe I could roll on a little bit of my own experience in that, in that regard. That, that That's great. That's great, Chris. Thank you for that. Yeah. But and I, that's actually a good segue, right? Just as you were saying that things you know were less expensive when we were younger, I think we're all aware of the, of the concerns about stuff getting more expensive as we get older. I mean, and by older, I mean like a couple of months from now. So I guess gas prices are coming down, but I've, I've seen, you know, basically every business news show I watch, they start talking about inflation. I've seen reports that they say in the UK, they think inflation is going to hit 18%. Of course, in Turkey, they said it's 70%. But so, so we, you know, we need somebody to save us from all this. So Russell, that's your cue. First of all, I guess you're on mute. So that's always good. That's always good to start out on. <laughs> mute. That's that's a great way to get to start your own presentation. Um, my my personal story is not going to be uh, nearly as impactful as Jessica's. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm currently on vacation. We went we rented a condo. And for the first time in a couple of years, I bought some deli meat. 
And, you know, to notice that the same deli meat from two years ago had gone from $10 to $16 a pound, right, is that inflation that we're talking about. And, and so while obviously it's not as a, uh, uh, you know, traumatic experience as Jessica might be going through, it is an experience that is affecting so many people, where, no matter where you are on the income spectrum, every day in every little thing that they do. Um, so realistically, I want to take a couple of minutes, discuss what causes it kind of doing for, for Harvard students, an X10 version of inflation, <laughs> um, and then kind of what's going on without getting into the politics of it, really, uh, and just kind of say, okay, and then close up with, hey, what can we do? So uh, for me, I'm Russ Rivera. I'm the founder and president of Voice Wealth Management. Uh, I'm big into financial literacy, too. I go to nursery schools and do it. So, you know, I think it's you, you, the younger you start, the better off just to get behind Victor and Chris and, and Jessica on that as well. So you, you can always start super early. But talking about inflation, um, so there are two different things that can cause it. One, increased money supply in the economy, right? We print dollars, there's the same amount of goods. We've got more dollars chasing the same amount of goods, which means we could afford to pay more dollars for the same amount of goods. So that can push up prices of the stuff that we have. The other thing that we also went through over the last couple of years is insufficient output. So insufficient production. So we had a chip shortage that led to prices of many things, depending on those chips, uh, going higher. So, for example, cars became more expensive because they didn't have the computer chips they needed to build cars. So it could be more money chasing the same amount of goods or the reverse, less amount of goods with the same amount of money. It's essentially two sides of the same coin uh, that's going on. So that, and some people in terms of terms call it overheating. So how does it spiral, right? We talk, sometimes you talk about an inflationary spiral, which some would say we're in now. So it's more money chasing the same goods, pricing poor people out, which means some people say, hey, we need to help these people. Let's give them more money. Well, guess what? That's more money chasing the same goods then people start to think that inflation is permanent and change behavior and start buying more and more and more and more now. And so how do we stop that? Uh, it produces a psychology of inflation that prices are rising. People should buy things now before they rise, uh, raising demand, leading to higher prices. This has happened in many economies uh, to different scales, as Victor mentioned, you know, Turkey, 70%. Uh, you know, Zimbabwe is a famous example of it being like a trillion percent per year is basically they just printed more dollars. Weimar Germany uh, in the interwar period also had a lot of inflation, uh, super high inflation as well. Uh, it usually doesn't mean that your economy is doing well, but nonetheless, that's where we stand to do what it is. And because of inflation, one way to do that, one way the Federal Reserve tries to stop people or to incentivize people um, and stop inflation is basically by raising interest rates. So what does raising interest rates do? It incentivizes people to save money and stop spending, put it in the bank. Therefore, money comes out of the economy, chasing the same amount of goods, bringing price levels lower, or at least lowering the pressure to increase prices. right? So that's kind of what happens. And of course, the general economic effects of people not spending money is the economy shrinks and we head into recession. And that's kind of what we're balancing now. Okay, so what can an individual do to protect themselves, especially in this inflationary period? Most people right now are, because of inflation and market performance, 10 to 25% poorer than they were just a year ago, right? The value of their dollars has gone down 10%, and the value of their portfolios have gone down if they have. In most cases, that's the average person. So what does that mean in terms of setting up your financial plans and in terms of what you can do now to try to protect? Well, one, if you're building a financial plan or working with a planner to build one, maybe you need to price more inflation into that plan and setting up future plans and lifestyle. Most models, basically, if you're under the age of 60, you've really never lived in a period of inflation, right? The last time we had a serious period of inflation was the early 1980s coming down from Paul Volcker. So again, like I said, if you're under the age of 60, you've never really been an adult been an adult and dealt with this. So you have to maybe price more inflation into um, your financial plan. There are certain elements that have always had high inflation, education, healthcare, those have always been priced in, but maybe in a general price level, you need to do that yourself, which means you might need to save more now to get where you want to go later. 
And again, certain assets can still be affected differently by inflation. What happens? Well, real estate holds up. Owning a more, having a mortgage is great in an inflationary period because you're paying a lower fixed rate while perhaps your income and your uh, home value is going up over time. Stocks are kind of mixed, right? You have a slowing economy, theoretically, as you're trying to fight inflation, but dollars are dollars. Earnings can go up because you're just buying it with cheaper dollars, but the nominal value of the stock may go up as well. So you're generally holding up okay. Nominal bonds. So just lending money to anybody and saying, hey, I'll give you $1,000 today. You give me an interest rate and $1,000 in the future isn't good in a pe period of inflation, right? Because those that $1,000 in the period of time will be worth a lot less in a period in, in, future, in the future than it would be today. So you could use inflation-linked bonds or Series I bonds, which you can buy through the uh, through treasurydirect.gov, every, every person can buy $10,000 per year. So I have bought it for me and for my wife and my kid, and we did it in 2020, and we did it in 2021. Those are paying just shy of 10% today, at least for the next six months. Uh, and that interest rate will be good through October, and then it will reset, and that interest rate resets every six months. You can go to treasurydirect.gov and read more about them. And then theoretically, there are other assets that should be doing well in a period of inflation, uh, mostly because they're a fixed quantity, but haven't performed. So you have real estate that kind of does well, stocks that are mixed, nominal bonds, not good. But what about things like gold or even crypto? Those things, feel, right? Crypto, to some extent, did go up in a period of inflation in the period of 2020 to 2021. And then we reach this inflection point and it's kind of, you know, obviously fallen up off tre tremendously since then. Gold's never followed it. Gold was always considered a, a good hedge because against inflation because it's a fixed quantity and people do accept it as a currency. I'm not sure why that hasn't happened, but at least in theory, those are so that is something that should also do well in a period of inflation. Again, even though it's been fairly steady over the last couple of years. So that it, those are some of the things that you could use um, when trying to remodel how your financial plan should be set up for the future in terms of how much money you actually need, and of course the assets that help you get there. So uh, of course I welcome questions and discussion and everything else. The instrument gaining nearly ten percent. It's nine point six two. It's the Series I bond. It is. You can buy them at treasurydirect.gov. Please go there to see all the terms, conditions, whatever else it is you might need. Again, get them for yourself, get them for your kids. You have to hold them for a year, but you can hold them up for up to 30. Uh, so, you know, that's pretty cool too. So. Terrific. Thanks very much, Russell. That was great. So if I'd known you back then, I, I could have skipped intro to economics. <laughs> So why don't we throw it open? I see a bunch of people have different questions. Chris, should we just let people raise their hands and, you know? Yeah, what I would recommend if if you're if you if you want to ask a question out loud, just turn on your video, unmute yourself, and go ahead and ask because I always think it's better to see who who's ever asking the question. Yeah. Um, and I think if everybody's okay with it, should we just continue the recording? Because a lot of times, you know, some of the real valuable information. Yeah, why don't we recording. why don't we do that because i think we will get some valuable information and just to for those who join later just to know this will be recorded and it won't be shared uh you know very widely but within the ivy life community so that if you do ask a question uh, both the question and the answer will be on the video yep. i so, think jessica had a question yeah. hi thank you everybody for fascinating presentations uh i wanted to address my question to russell Really appreciated your uh, concrete data-driven um, discussion of how inflation is eating away at our money. Um, and I just looked you up online, uh, your wealth voice management, and wanted to, I mean, this is a free service here, but obviously everyone here is looking for clients. So I wanted to dive right in and find out, Russell, about how you work. Uh, do you do direct investment with a wrap fee like many uh, CFPs do, or do you advise for a set fee uh, to do, let's say, a retirement plan and assessment? I mean, what's what's the deal? I do a little both. Um, so I have 
situations. And I, I don't want to take away from the more generic questions I think people will have. Um, and so we can talk more about it offline, but I do do wrap fee, that kind of thing. And I also have planning only. So I, I kind of try to make myself flexible to whatever people need in order to make that work for them. Uh, but I do both is the short answer. Thank you. Flexible guy. <laughs> thank, thank you for that question, Jessica. Do we have a, anybody else who's next? I have a very specific question for Russell. Would the Series I bond be a good place to park some cash for, like we're going to be paying college tuition for twins over the next five, four years. Would it be a good place to sort of park some of that cash for a year, earn the 10% and then, you know, cash out? Is it that liquid or would that be hard to do with that particular you would have to hold it for a year. And if you sell it within five, you lose three months of interest. Okay, okay, thank you. So, I mean, again, the question is, do you, you know, if you parked it for a year and you were able to get 9.6% over a year and you sold it, you'd still get seven and a half percent. Right. Right, so, I mean, some people will be very happy with that. Better I can't answer what works for you. <laughs> I, I get, right, I can't answer that for you, but, yeah, you know. Um, so Jessica had a follow-up question. Um, what are other the inflation tips. hedges such as tips? Yeah. Uh, tips are okay too. Uh, they work as well. Uh, again, you can buy those in direct issue. Um, those again, they're not as easy to buy directly. So you can certainly buy ETFs that are tips. You can buy mutual funds that have tips. Those have also not performed well over the last year because they're also based, partially based on inflation on uh, nominal bonds. So, um, you know, they're down less than nominal bonds, but, you know, again, you should be getting a higher coupon over those, for those over time, um, you know, but let's say I, I'm pulling numbers out of my rear end, so I don't know exactly what it is, but let's say tips are down five to 6%, whereas nominal bonds are down 10% uh, on a year, on a year to date basis. Marlena, I see your hand is up. So what, how are you? How's your, what's your question? A question for Russell again. What do you expect the interest rate to be adjusted to when it is adjusted in six months? Um, it, it really depends. I would say it's going to be somewhere around where the um, where the, the the headline CPI number is during that time. So with oil prices dropping, it may not quite be as high. Uh, certainly, might not be as high as where it is. But of course, we don't know what's going to happen over the next several months. Uh, but the, you know, the number for as of July was around 8.5%. So I, you know, it's somewhere around uh, maybe 75 to 100 basis points, whatever that headline CPI number is. So I'd wait for what's happening in September, October. That'll give you a, the best idea. I thought I would also mention in terms to the general world economic outlook that Germany has already announced gas, gas rationing. Hmm. News yes. today. Yeah, Marley, yeah, I've heard I heard that. I've, they're, they're talking about power rationing. So it this this could be a little a little a little bumpy. I mean, I it's it's a lot hard odd to say, but you know, in many ways the US is much better off than yeah. than, than yeah. Europe, which you which you normally think it was being sort of on a par. There, so, there are also plans to limit the use of electricity. It was announced today. Yeah. So that yeah, you can just imagine you know, no air conditioning from you know, noon to two o'clock. Um, so why don't we do this? If, if folks have additional questions or you want to reach out to anybody in the group afterward, on the panel afterwards, I put my LinkedIn information, at least in the in the chat. So if you can, you can reach out to me, I think that's the easiest way. And then if you say, gee, can you put me in touch with, you know, Jessica or Chase or, or, or Hannah or Russell, uh, I, I can make that, that introduction to anybody who's on the call. Um, the other thing, I know we're kind of short on time. So maybe if I could ask them, each of the member of the panel, you know, we try to make these these uh, sessions as as uh, as useful uh, and actionable as possible, and I think that's you know everybody's done a really great job of that. So maybe I would ask each person in the panel that maybe spend a couple of minutes. So if there's one thing you could tell somebody that at you know, two o'clock when this when this event is over, they should rush off and do X, right? That should be the first thing on their priority list. So maybe if I, we could just kind of go around really quickly and say. So I'll start with you, Chase. What, what does somebody need to get done this afternoon? If you haven't already, 
speak with an individual or look at your portfolio and just reevaluate your investment strategy because hopefully right now we've been in the down market for the past now year and so looking to see that you know in the near future this correction come up especially as like russell was mentioning some of the inflational numbers cool down okay thank you hannah Ooh, that this is a tough one um i guess i would say putting a financial plan together um and working with a professional for that it doesn't mean that they need to manage your money there are financial professional you know certified financial planners out there that will just build you a financial plan which i i highly recommend to anyone um i have someone that does it for me as well so even as a professional i have my own planner um so I, I would say that and then with that i want to add one other because i run into this way too often if you have kids and don't have a will that's like absolute number one go do that right away terrific thank you jessica so i would say you know with all the noise that's in the market currently don't be so hasty to make quick decisions on things that are short term in nature think of the long game and evaluate what that means for you and you don't know i would agree with chase you should consult with an advisor and just have a sounding board of somebody to talk to and help you evaluate. That's one of the biggest values I think the financial advisors bring uh, this whole team here that has been talking today. And um, and Hannah, I like what you were saying earlier about um, really getting your parents, sit down with your parents and talk through what they need, what are their wishes. It's a hard conversation, but I think it's one that's necessary because you don't want to get there and then have to figure things out. Well, yeah, because if you wait, it's going to be a worse conversation. Exactly. So, Russell? Well, I will, you know, yes, no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your age or your income or anything like that, you deserve the opportunity to talk to a professional. There is somebody out there for you if you look. But in terms of actionable things that you can do today, number one thing I think most people need to do that they don't know is check to see their cash position and whether or not they have enough in case of an emergency, just taking us back to the top of the call. Terrific. What would it, do you have enough cash to live if you lost your job tomorrow? Do you have enough cash to live if you need a new water heater? Do you have enough cash for those situations? Terrific. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one I, of the comment I have, Victor, real quick is it, it, taking into account my own experience and also a lot of the most recent comments from the panel. Um, it, having a someone else, an outside professional, even in Hannah's case, she does it herself, but you know, the old thing about the cobbler's child going on shot. Um, I think that it really helps to have that intellectual distance. And to Jessica's point as well, that going through those what ifs, it's very hard to do that for your own life because we don't like to think about some of the bad things that can happen to us. But if, if you have an outside professional, that's their job to take you through those what ifs and to make sure you're ready regardless of what happens. And if none of it comes to pass, great, but you need to really be prepared for that. So that, and I can definitely relate to that, including having lost a, a, a water heater literally yesterday at 7.30, you know, and having no <laughs> hot water. So and needing to, to have an unexpected expense. You never know when that stuff's gonna happen, large or small. So, so you got a, a literal cold shower. Uh, my wife did, which is even worse. She called me <laughs> at 730 saying, I just had a cold shower. You better fix that. So <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Well, I, I'd like to thank the panel. I appreciate all, all, all the advice, certainly that they've given and you know the time and effort that they put in in, in getting ready for this event. So that, that was terrific. Um, I'd like to thank Chris for arranging this and having and for suggesting this in the first place. And obviously, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience. Uh, you know, the questions were great. We appreciate your attention. Uh, we hope that we found this at least a little bit helpful. And you know, would be happy to you know connect with other folks and talk about you know uh, uh, you know what Chris has set up here at, at Ivy Life and uh, and whether you know this might be an interesting uh, forum for you to join us uh, in uh, in the future. So th Absolutely. thanks. Absolutely. Toss it back to you. Yeah, so thanks so much, everybody, especially the panel and Victor for the wonderful planning and the guests for their great questions. Um, I, get, I get all kinds of questions by email and text about when the next event is. 
Everything we do will make its way to ivylife.org. Uh, we will be putting up our fall schedule in the next couple of weeks. Generally, the plan is to have two events per month, one being similar to this in, the, in that we're getting experts from the community together. So if you are such an expert, and you have something to offer, don't hesitate to email me at chris at IV life.org. Uh, and then the other meeting will be more of a traditional Ivy Life networking meeting where we all get to meet like-minded professionals in various professional niches. And uh, one innovation, if you can call it that, is I plan on having a topic for those monthly networking meetings just to sort of spark some thoughts, more of a general topic, so we can have a rallying point and as you go through your busy weeks and days, you can think, hmm, is that something that would be of interest to me? Maybe I, if it is, then show up and meet some uh, folks from within the community. But again, go to ivylife.org, check us out if you're not part of the community. Um, and as a harbinger of the future, I also want to share is we're trying to pivot to more of a sponsor supported community and rely a little less on member dues so get a larger portion of our funding from a sponsorship community. Um, think about the types of uh, people that might wanna have a strategic relationship with the Ivy League alumni community so that we can offload some of the, the budgetary burdens we have at Ivy Life uh, so that we can continue to develop the tech platforms we have. So uh, anyway, thanks everybody. Uh, Chase, Jessica, Hannah, and Russell, you've all been longtime members of the community, so so great to have you. And you know, in many cases, this is a deeper dive into all of your expertise that, that I've heard, even though I've known many of you for years. So it's really great to, to, to take that deep dive, and I'm looking forward to doing that with, with many others in the future. And maybe we can make this kind of an annual thing with you guys, because I think this is a topic that is evergreen and ever important. And maybe next year, we I hope we won't be having the inflationary part of the discussion, Russell, you'll talk about something else. So uh, great to have everybody. And uh, I'll stop the recording now. And, uh, you know, again, uh, have a wonderful rest of the summer uh, and stay cool out there. And I hope to see you all very soon.